In this ICS Hot Takes video, the SANS ICS team discusses some of the important issues and topics to consider while waiting for more information about the 2021 security incident that has halted production and distribution at Coors. The team also uses the recent security incident at Verkata to discuss the importance of security cameras within production environments and what organizations should be learning from this event. If you enjoy the SANS ICS Hot Take videos, please like and subscribe to the channel. Feel free to leave any comments you have here or head over to the SANS ICS forum and engage the SANS ICS community. All right, thank you for everybody for joining us today. I, I'm here with the SANS members of the SANS ICS team. We have Jeff, Jeff Shearer from Grayman's Cyber, Jason Dealey from Northern Strong Security, Tom Liston from Bad Wolf Security, and myself, Don C. Weber from Cutaway Security. And we wanted to all come together. There's been a few things in the news recently, and we wanted to do another SANS hot take uh, on these things. So we have a uh, the breach up in uh, Coors. Uh, something happened at Coors, and uh, we want to discuss that a little bit. And the Verkata camera uh, issue, their physical security is so important within ICS, and also the consideration of cloud services and the relationships there are important as well as we start branching into that. So we want to discuss that as well. So, uh, you know, once again, we're, just, we're back together for uh, hot takes. And, uh, you know, Jason, you had mentioned that uh, reading the SEC filing for the Coors, uh, something had jumped out, jumped out at you. Uh, you want to expand upon that? Yeah, so in the, in the filing, they indicated they did indicate that there was a breach and they had uh, systems that were disrupted, but they also indicated some uh, there was indication of production being halted. And the one thing that stands out is um, also it was across um, many facilities. My understanding the um, the one thing to point out is is immediately we tend to think that oh it must be within their control system and i think the one thing we need to recognize is that for many manufacturing environments um there is dependent systems that are interrelated that may not actually be the control system but are dependent upon certain it systems in order to um prevent you know production problems one of those being the warehouse system um, the labeling system on like a palletizer and so forth. And so, you know, without knowing exactly what happened at Molson Coors, the reality is that, you know, the, we, we do have relation, strong relationships between the ERP system and, and, you know, manufacturing execution system and warehouse management systems that typically reside within their IT environment, but are heavily dependent upon their operation in order to prevent, you know, halting of production. One example, um, just to put it out there, is uh, if you have a palletizer. So after you know producing product, you essentially you put it on a pallet. The pallet then goes into a wrapper and uh, where it wraps with cellophane. And then at that point in time, there's usually a printer system that will take the label um, based on information of the products produced that's stored somewhere in either ERP or manufacturing execution system or or the warehouse management system. And that information needs to go to the printer. The printer then needs to put the label on the pallet. And then at that point, it can get put into the warehouse. So without having that label being able to print, the question becomes, what do you do with that pallet? Because you have a whole backlog of product that needs to be palletized as well in order to be moved into the warehouse. So, you know, that that's just an example um, of how you have this interdependency. And so it really I, brings a question, you know, when they say halted production, what exactly does that mean? Yeah, I, and I, I think I think that's pretty important to point out because you know, so many people like to focus on the critical infrastructure aspect. What is catastrophic? You know, catastrophic failure is the the worst thing that can happen. Well, Coors is a business. They're some people might say they're critical infrastructure because of how much they drink, but it's, you know, in reality, they, they are a business. They, they, they are critical to the certain communities that they're in. Uh, they've got a large presence in a lot of cities. Uh, and so that is an impact there. But, uh, you know, when we're thinking about, you know, uh, understanding the impacts to business, doing threat modeling around this, uh, imploding a, a cistern or something like that, while catastrophic failure and goes to safety isn't necessarily probably one of the things that they're most concerned about from a business impact. Yeah, I would, I would yeah. say, you know, kind of in that perfect day scenario, you, 
you might actually be brewing beer or making a product for another company. So you would take information and say, do I have the materials available to even make a product? And so there, there you're touching a physical asset saying, how much do I actually have? When you run a recipe, you're going to make sure that you have all the ingredients that you want. And eventually you're going to pass that recipe down to physical machines, right? You know, tanks, uh, pumps to fill tanks. You're going to set uh, times and temperatures and ingredients. You're going to fill things. You're going to mix things. You're going to heat things. You're going to let it ferment. <clears throat> and you need, you need that record of how long and what product have you made. And so there are many times when an IT system has to touch or direct an ICS system. And so that interconnectivity, if it doesn't exist, becomes downtime, right? And as Jason said, once we make a product, we need to have that history or that genealogy track with the product and be able to say, here's what you received. And so there's a big orchestration that goes on. And if any of those systems stop, then your business is actually impacted. So I think we can say that in some way at an abstracted layer, that's what happened, right? A business system, it sounds like affected the ability to produce or to track or, you know, to create that product in a, in a way in which we monitor critical parameters and said we made that product safely. I mean, and the, the elephant in the room that, that I, I think nobody seems to be talking about with all of this is, you know, what actually happened to these guys? Um, this has all the hallmarks of some kind of a ransomware attack. You're seeing that it is affecting multiple locations. Um, and, and if that is the case, it very well could be that, you know, this doesn't touch, uh, touch the OT networks at all. It, it may just be a, a full-blown widespread IT uh, ransomware situation where, and, and maybe even just out of an abundance of safety, they've just cut ties completely between the IT and the OT networks and, and just gone to shutdown rather than risk, you know, OT systems uh, from, from any kind of impact from this. So, uh, you know, while they don't say so, I mean, it, Coors is being very, very tight lipped about what actually happened to them. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, this has, this, this is, this is an interesting scenario if for no other reason than it's, that it's probably, uh, doing a really good job of showing that you don't have to go to the OT systems to cause a major impact and a shutdown of an organization. You can do that just, just by simply uh, impacting the IT system. I think uh, and hopefully, good. hopefully we hear people, hopefully we hear them talk about it. Like, uh, you know, PySoft came to, uh, the SANS ICS summit two years ago and talked about um, some of the things that they experienced during their breach. Uh, the one thing that I, I, I didn't get out of them was uh, um, associated with their code repositories and how that was impacted. Uh, but they did, you know, talk about how their um, admit, uh, uh, their Active Directory infrastructure, you know, had taken a hit and uh, and the, and they had to clean up that. You know, thinking about that, thinking about the, uh, um, you know, the different environments and certainly any type of uh, credential compromise or, or, you know, potential ransomware or anything like that, that could leak over into the production environment and have an impact on the Windows management servers. But I think this is, I really, really hope they talk about this uh, because we can say, you know, just from both uh, uh, Jason and Jeff's input associated with, uh, um, you know, the uh, uh, not just the brewing uh, um, uh, and product making uh, part of it, but the distribution part. So this is gonna be a big lesson learned, not only for food and beverage uh, production, but also for distribution that other larger organizations should be considering. And as more organizations go to this whole just-in-time model of, of production, um, any kind of disruption, anywhere in the organization can cause just a cascading effect everywhere. So that's, that's the other. So Je Jason and Jeff, I mean, to, to Tom's point, you know, if, uh, um, if it is, if it is distribution that is, you know, taking the major hit here, um, how does that impact production? Do you just keep making things? So, you know, are they shutting down production because, you know, they, they can't push stuff out. They don't know where it's going. Well, it's, it's very hard to continue because you, you ultimately, like we're not talking about a warehouse the size of a two-car garage here. 
we're talking about something extremely massive, mm -hmm. especially large, large um, production facilities. And so, you know, you, you, there is a continuity that has to happen from, from production all the way through to being put in warehouse. And then when an order gets fulfilled as far as shipment, they have to be able to pull from the warehouse and put it on the right truck in order to go to the right location, right? So the point here is that if you disrupt the warehouse management system, it's, you're, you're impacting distribution immediately. It doesn't matter whether you have, you know, you may have tow motor operators that are, you know, utilizing automation inside of their warehousing system, but it still requires that, that genesis or that, uh, that record of the client customer where that needs to go. And as well as the genesis or the, the genealogy of the, uh, the product that's produced. Um, especially when we get into, you know, food, especially food and beverage. I mean, you know, nobody wants a recall on stuff. And if you do have a recall, you want to be able to narrow it down. So, you know, there's, there's other systems that may come into play there. Um, you know, especially from, a, uh, being able to trace and track the genealogy and it gets a little gray where that system's stored, but fundamentally that uh, at some end of the day, it gets put up into, you know, some kind of management system at the top inside the IT. And uh, it's, you know, recorded and vaulted there for a period of time. So to just continue, like, you know, we just look at the label. If I can't put a label on something, is it possible to go manual? I don't know. That That's not easy because you still need the information mm -hmm from the system that where the labeler gets its information. So if I can't get, you know, if I can't make an ID associated to the palette, if we look at genealogy in general, it's, it's a continuation of, of data and uh, references, if you will, um, over the life of the, from, from the initial raw ingredients all the way through to being put on a palette wrapped up, and so there's this concatenation of a string of, of information, right? And so if there's a gap in there, you really lose that continuity, which does make it very impactful. So yeah, it's, it'd be nice to say, yeah, we could just write something down. But again, if we can't create the record for that stage, I don't know how we possibly continue. And then how long could you continue? Like especially in the food and beverage industry where you have to know uh, the provenance of everything that's going into that in case you do have a recall. Uh, you're, you're, you're just, it, the, the, the potential downside of continuing operation under that circumstance is just, you know, really horrific for them. And you can apply this, this, everything we've spoke about, I mean, where you, the, the, this is the leverage off of this particular incident, but the reality is this is, you could take the same concept, doesn't matter what industry in the manufacturing space, right? Food and beverage, assembly, like automotive, right? Um, all the way through, they all, you know, fundamentally the systems are relatively the same. There's some so, nuances and differences, but the only, the, we can get both challenges later to address, but where this relationship becomes a challenge is when you're trying to cleanly draw a line to say, this is electronic perimeter, let everything below do its thing, and being able to run without the top, that gets less and less a reality. And I don't know if it ever really truly was a reality for some of these companies. So would, or, with other organizations, uh, you know, whether it's distribution or uh, um, a food and beverage like this, would they do like a safety stand down? So is, is Pepsi and Coke and uh, uh, Miller, are they doing safety stand downs to talk about uh, the, um, uh, talk like we're talking right now and talk about how they'd address some of those things? So I, I think this whole event underlies the need for architecture reviews. So you have to know what you have and you have to know where you're going. And there's been a lot of work in the past, even five to 10 years that talks about secured architectures for business systems, touching industrial control systems. And you know, power industries and other industries are kind of the beacon in which we drive toward. But at the end of the day, um, are they going to spend capital to mitigate risk? And so Jason and myself, I know personally, because we've worked together a long time, have worked with companies to do like five-year roadmaps to say, here's where your architecture currently is. 
and we've been we've both been involved in projects where we've moved systems that traditionally thought they should live in the IT space and have pushed them down into the OT space because there's more tentacles actually touching OT assets and then a few pipes out to talk, uh, you know, very controlled, very secured pipes to IT systems that are required. So quality control systems are getting pushed down. So all in all, the architectures are changing in order to support kind of the world events that we're having right now, I think. So Tom, you, you've done a lot, you, you've built a lot of training uh, for people uh, to introduce them to uh, uh, new concepts and new projects. Would there be any recommendations around how to leverage uh, what little we know here uh, within an organization to help their teams? I think probably the biggest takeaway for any organization uh, right now, looking at what we do know, is that uh, that understanding that uh, your production environment is an integrated whole. It's, it's not IT versus OT, uh, because if we, if we take, you know, have an impact on either of those two portions, it can shut the whole thing down. And so I think it's important for organizations to take a look at their environment and kind of decide what happens if we lose X in our environment and whatever X may be, it may be a back end, you know, a, a, it might be a, a customer database. It might be um, just, you know, the inventory database, something like that. What would we be able to do and what should we do if we lose those, those information assets at some point? So I think it's important for organizations to sit down and kind of, I don't know, uh, just kind of tabletop that kind of uh, incident and, and make decisions ahead of time. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we constantly do with clients is talk to them about making these decisions ahead of time because you don't want to be making these decisions uh, in the heat of the moment when you're dealing with an actual incident, you got way more things, you know, going on in your life at that point than trying to make decisions on how you're going to respond. You should know how you're going to respond ahead of time. So that would be my, my take in all of this. Well, firsthand, I've seen an or a, a, a manufacturing facility that was dealing with ransomware and they did not fully and completely understand the relationship of connection, communication and data flow. Um, data requirements in order to maintain production, and um, you know when you're when you're under threat of ransomware, it's a very different, you know, it's a very scary situation because it looks like the world is crumbling down around you, and so not having an understanding um, and taking those knee jerk reactions. I, I did personally see where that did actually cause more production failure than the actual ransomware event itself. In fact, the ransomware event, that was the, the, the issue, the fundamental issue that was causing them disruption in the, in the plant was already dealt with by the controls team and was unaware of that actually, that, that there was a misunderstanding of the level of, of production. You know, when they're saying they're impacting, that, that's also a very, what does that mean? You know, like, are you talking about like five minute impacts? Are you talking about it's making somebody have to reboot a computer every now and then? Like there's varying degrees of what impact means. So you have that, if that's not well understood or being able to clearly communicate and you're unable to determine, understand the relationship of services between IT and OT or um, information systems and OT, then if you suddenly are just like, I just got to shut this port down and literally going like, shut her down, shut her down. And ultimately doing that. And then production being like, well, what just happened? You know, like that it's, 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 you know, it's, it's not really laughable because these people hurt, but the point is it's something that's really, you know, that's where the planning needs to come into play and the, the true understanding. Um, Cause I, that's, I mean, Jeff and I have, and, and, you know, maybe others have seen where, you know, there's it's like you can control certain elements when you're designing and building these things out but then as soon as you get into an information system wanting to tell talk to each other it's almost like i built my piece 
they're building their piece and then just some magic glue and it just like slams together and then they're off and running because they never actually worked out or sat in the same room on how do we architect and design this out so we understand even documenting you know it's it's if we're going to allow something that's not ideal coming across a perimeter well it'd be great to have that as a document to know is that a need is that a want or is that a nice to have and you know so that you can determine under under these um, hostile conditions of how to respond. So, Jeff, any thoughts, uh, any uh, last minute thoughts from you, Jeff? Yeah, yeah. So there's there's kind of uh, two owners in this situation. There's the customer, the people who are making production. Um, but there's, you know, plants are filled with OEM equipment. Most most vendor, most companies don't build their own equipment. And so um, I have worked with vendors who put their stake in the ground and they say this is you know you're going to drill a pipe from your plant floor all the way out to my cloud and that's just the way it is and so it becomes an interesting swiss cheese exercise if you're trying to secure those pipes out to somewhere and, and or bi-directional connections for EOM to understand the machines. Um, so my, what is my point? My point is that OEMs and uh, security vendors, when I go into as a customer advocate and I say, let me contact your software vendors and say, how do you work across the demilitarized zone or how do we work to secure yourself? is vendors need to participate just as much as the customers do because many times a plant is just a whole, you know, um, just a whole field of different vendors. And so the vendors don't often play together well because some of them are competitors. And a lot of times they don't have the customer's best interest. And so long story short is architectures with these machines and software pieces need to be investigated and understood to the point that they know that when I disconnect this because of a ransomware event or any kind of IT event, then I can continue with my production. And that, yeah, that we, oftentimes re causes a re-architecture of the technology. Yeah, it's also the knowledge, if you know, like we look at worming ransomware and if we were, you know, if we were able to fully understand what system was impacted, but the point is, is that when you're going through your architecture, you can threat model it to say specifically for ransomware and looking at the history of worming type of ransomware. And because, uh, I mean, if it was, you know, if my warehouse man management system was impacted, it's like, are we talking the server? But how did the ransomware get on that server? And if it was, well, it was in a flat network with a bunch of other servers up in IT and it just propagate around using 445 or whatever, you know, it's like, maybe we could have architected that out, mm -hmm. right? And those are things that I think when we're, when we're doing architecture is, you know, we have to take cases that we know of, and this is why it's important and why we wish we could get more information about these events is we can't just say, ah, oh, it's ransomware. We know enough about it. Let's get, no, we got to really continue to drive this because, you know, um, obviously ransomware is not the only threat out there, but the same token is it's a, it's a significant threat as shown to manufacturing. Right. Absolutely. When it, one of the, one of the hardest things that uh, one of the um, biggest challenges that I had when I was doing incident response uh, was helping people to, even in the IT, especially in the IT, I was in the IT world doing this. And uh, when a server would get malware on it and people were, you know, just use our AV, our AV will clean it up and everything's good to go. And, you know, I had to remind them, no, this isn't a, a user's workstation. This is a server that got malware on it. How did that happen? We need to understand that because we have a bigger problem if that is, uh, if that's actually going on. So uh, good, Tom joined back. Thank you for joining back, Tom. <laughs> you know, when you turn off notifications and uh, your computer is accidentally unplugged. Uh, oh, Beth? yeah, I actually, uh, that's, that's actually what I thought, it, that thought happened to you. So, and uh, th that's good, but it, that's a good segue. I'm glad you're back, Tom. Um, uh, and we should probably talk about, uh, you know, and kind of move on to the Verkata 
uh, incident. And this is associated with, for those that aren't familiar, uh, Verkata is a, a, a company that sells camera services to large organizations. And from the uh, articles that I read, it sounds like a hacktivist, somebody who is uh, whose main goal is to uh, get into organizations and force them to act better uh, is uh, uh, got into this account. They, you know, through some means got uh, credentials for an administrator who just happened to have some Excel, uh, elevated privileges within that organization. It didn't sound like from the descriptions that I read that uh, they were, uh, that they had to elevate their privileges once they got in, but it could be a problem or I mean, possibility. Uh, but once they did, once they accessed that environment, uh, because of uh, those privileges, they could access all the customers. And that's really kind of the concern to me around third-party services, uh, something that I always uh, asked about when I was uh, assisting with the uh, vulnerability and risk management, what, and we're talking to service providers was the fact like, okay, how do you manage um, your client's data? Um, if you got compromised, would, would ours be compromised with the other organizations? Considering that for a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of services are coming into the industrial control arena, uh, there's some mandates by some organizations uh, that make things like batteries that uh, because of maintenance, they have to have uh, access through their cloud infrastructure down into that which is on the control network. So wanted to talk to everybody about that. Uh, we have physical security impacts as well. Um, and actually, Tom, you know, and I know for a fact that you've been into uh, um, uh, some medical facilities and some other areas uh, where uh, actually owning the uh, CCTV system uh, um, was important to that incident. Uh, so could you kind of describe, you know, from a physical security aspect of what the issue is with uh, having control of those systems? Yeah, so um, one time we did a, um, a pen test for a medical facility and uh, we kind of took everything pretty quickly in the, in the organization. I mean, we were there for uh, five days doing, doing an internal pen test uh, and we pretty much owned everything in the first few days. So they just basically said, go around and see what else you can do. And one of the things we found was uh, we actually got control over the CCTV system. And one of the, one of the things that we were able to do by, by having control over that system was, so, so the, their attack threat in this case was to have somebody come into the facility, plug into a, uh, an open port someplace and, and go about attacking things. And, um, so what we were able to do when we had control of the CCTV system was we were able to go in and find ourselves in the video feed walking into the building. And then we were able to uh, just basically overwrite that section of the, uh, the video to just take out the fact that we had actually come into the building. So one of the things as a, as an, a defender you would be doing is saying, okay, we had this incident on this day. Somebody came in and plugged into the, uh, the, the network here and, um, Let's go and see if we can see who came into the building during that time. Well, that doesn't do you any good if the uh, attacker has been able to manipulate that data. So, yeah, that's that's one of the potential issues there. So, Jeff and Jason, the uh, um, understanding, you know, uh, uh, Tom's uh, um, access, you know, how we, and, and certainly every facility is different and certainly physical security uh, manages things, you know, maybe slightly different. They might not be recording things. They might just be, have a visual. So what's your experience with cameras uh, at different facilities and different sectors of uh, industrial controls? Um, I'll start. I know Jeff and I both have a lot we could talk about on this particular subject. Um, because I think that the one thing that Tom brought up is definitely an important aspect. The other thing we have to recognize too, is when we look at, you know, if we look at, uh, as far as where cameras are, they're, they're exhaustively used, um, in, in many different ways. So obviously there's the physical access, you know, security standpoint of just monitoring a gate or, you know, monitoring a yard or whatever. Um, there are also other cameras that are IP related. Um, which, you know, extends on the external support side, um, you know, not necessarily security cameras, but, you know, a machine builder may come in and they're using camera system to align for quality control, either for detection to see whether a part was done correctly, also for alignment to ensure that parts like if a robot or while the, you know, conveyor is moving to be able to put the part in the right place. And, you know, those are, 
you know, opportunities for having to have, especially industry 4.0 or some sort, having some connectivity outside because especially if it's a QA process. So, you know, cameras and control systems are, are you know, have multiple use cases. Specifically, and I'll, I'll pass this to Jeff because I know we have very similar thoughts on this, but um, one thing about security cameras in general is, you know, when we talk about those in control system, one of the, there's many ways as far as how do we get connectivity to that camera when it's in a remote location. And one thing I'd like to highlight, and it's not the only case, but in a lot of municipalities, they put their own backbone in for the, the city or the municipality, and they're trying to maximize the use of those backbones for um, other systems, right? As many as they can, whether it's for fire, police, you know, security, uh, pump water, you know, pump stations, values, and so forth. So there's a lot of shared media or media between that. And when you, you, you get some very interesting discussions, but one thing, uh, if, if I was to pwn, the first thing that comes to mind for me in a control system is owning a security camera. I, for me, I don't care too much about what I can see with that camera. For me, it's if I got into that camera and then I basically, I can look out the window and be like, that's interesting. But then I want to like turn around and say, how many doorways back to my SCADA environment? How many doorways back to, you know, the police department or other things, right? Like there's, the thing is, is that there's using it as a pivot point within the network to be able to turn around and go and attack or get to some other area. That, that Good. to me is a, a so vector. you're saying, so you're saying for, for uh, uh, in your mind, the biggest threat associated with that access visual access here is, uh, um, doing reconnaissance so that you can plan uh, next steps uh, um, for uh, an environment, especially if it's a physical intrusion, that's what you'd be trying well, to do. Pot potentially a beachhead, and I'll let Jeff talk a bit about this, but potentially having a, using it as a beachhead to attack other network systems that are not necessarily related to the security camera. And I'll let Jeff continue with that thought. Sure, no, it's, uh, so sometimes, the OT crowd, the only chance they get to talk to an IT person is because the OT side has a switch or assets out in a very remote place. Let's call it just a warehouse. And so there's switches that where we're running cameras out there and they say, hey, can I use your switch infrastructure to run a feed all the way back to, you know, our you know, digital recording systems of the cameras. And right there is a tie point now between an OT network and an IT network. And so we do things like, we'll just stuff you off on a different VLAN and sure, you can use our physical infrastructure to run it all the way back to IT. And so now I have, as Jason used, the beachhead. And so when Jason and I would go and do, you know, vulnerability tests, we would go look for these things because you would find in, in, you know, our vernacular multi-homed or dual homed assets, these DVRs that if I got into that system, now I had a way into an industrial control network. And so that, we, yeah. Okay. That, that, that's interesting. So you're, you're saying that, and, and I didn't catch that at first. And uh, so I'm, I'm uh, but to sure. clarify, um, you're talking about, so both of you would expect the controls, uh, the camera systems, CCTV, uh, to uh, be associated with the IT network and not necessarily the control network. Is that Affirmative. What you're Almost Excellent. always. Yeah. yeah. And, Almost uh, and always. Then, right. And so the, uh, but the, they, they, can tend to piggyback uh, the distribution that, uh, or excuse me, the uh, distillery that I went to and, and did an assessment on, um, they very specifically ensured that the camera system was, uh, had its own management network and its own switches and so forth. So, uh, um, but I, I can see where that would uh, um, be that uh, tie-in. Yeah, That's the financial easy. situation yeah. is, yeah. hey, you've already got stuff out there. Just let me plug my camera in and we'll run a VLAN back and everything bypasses um jason was going to jump in there so go ahead but yeah no i agree i think that when we we have to separate that if if i'm owning a facility and i'm going to put a camera system in it's easier for me to run a separate network dedicated to that camera if i'm running a pipeline or if i'm running a water distribution and i'm and i'm now i have to use telemetry 
and I want to put camera systems on that telemetry, you know, the, the city may have paid for, you know, a complete backbone of fiber and wireless or whatever, they're not going to put in a whole different infrastructure. Nope. Same with, especially in, a, in you look at like a pump station too, right? Like a, either, you know, a small gas, remote gas storage facility or whatever, you know, the, there's, it's, it's a cost inhibitive to be able to put in a completely separate one. It's not to say we can't do other things because we've mm. I've designed those, but the, but it's not in the forefront. It's the initially it's the hey, there's a network there and I can get out there. Hey, how about we just set on? Yeah, there's lots of bandwidth or you know it it's it's not ill intent. It's just looking at trying to maximize the investment. Absolutely, and and I th- I think we can you know when when I look at these things and I talk about scoping for uh, you know a, an assessment and uh, or or I talk about uh, you know we're going to evaluate certain things as a part of uh, um, when we're looking at the uh, enforcement boundaries uh, between IT and OT. Uh, you know I've had some organizations where I've said hey we need to look at these the CCTV stuff and they're like no 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 that's not in scope. But, you know, to your point, potentially that's where the, the bridges are yeah. associated with, with that. Um, one, one other point about cameras. Oh, so, so many times people think cameras, I'm just going to view something and then we can think about it in the next term of physical media comes together and maybe we can do something because there's an operating system on the thing that is recording. But um, cameras also do things that Jason talked about for how many, how many um, production pieces have I made? Is the level in the, in the bottle correct? Is the webbing correct? And so we find cameras doing things besides just looking for people. And that data is triggered through an industrial embedded system that is running an operating system that says, yes, the, the level is correct in a bottle, or a lot of times they'll do labelers and it's just whizzing by so fast you can't even see it but it's snapping it every single time um and so cameras do way more things than just view people for yes yeah, it's making micro adjustments too so it's actually influencing the yes operation. so ah, interesting. you yeah. you, inter- and- you you touched on one point Don, Don, i don't want to overlook and that's the you're you're asked to go in and this happens a lot when you're asked to go in and, and either you're you know doing an assessment of some sort or you're doing the design of some sort and i find you know ask 10 times and then ask one more are you is these all the systems that are there this is all it's related because a lot of times in it sometimes they want you to narrow the focus but at the same token it's like if you're on the if you're running a pcap and you're like there is other odd systems that I don't feel in scope, but it's on the same network. Time to go back and rediscuss what those things are. But at the same token, I have many times done design and it's like you ask and you ask and you ask, are all of those the endpoints? Are those the endpoints? Yes and yes and yes. Because they're thinking of the, the primary systems. Mm-hmm. They're not always thinking of the secondary systems. And absolutely, you know, one, one, one case was... Um, uh, was an HVAC system for uh, automotive assembly, and the and the irony is this: is in, in in most assembly plants for automotive, the paint area, the paint booth, is the bottleneck of the whole production. The paint booth has a high dependency on availability and capability of the HVAC system, but a lot of times the HVAC system is hand- managed by the business, the building management people, which are part of the IT group. And not necessarily part of the controls group. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's great that you're going there looking at everything related to the paint booth. But if you're not actually looking at another secondary system that really to the paint booth is a primary system, then it's kind of a loss. And we always find that there's always these little things, whether it's, you know, energy management or monitoring systems. You know, there's a lot of little tiny little subsystems that they're there for a reason, but we have to put, you know... I'm not saying we have to make our scope stupid big, but we do need to be recognizing the fact that, you know, sometimes clients, it's not that they want to necessarily narrow the scope. It's maybe because they're just don't quite fully grasp because they take for granted of a certain system that that just happens to be there and it's doing what it does. It's like, Oh yeah. Cause a lot of times you get that, you'll get that. Oh yeah. I, there is that thing. Like, there. That's, yeah. 
that's the answer that you get all the time is uh, you, you'll point out something, you get, say, well, how does that thing talk back? And you'll get that, oh, yeah. And then they'll go into it. and Oh, yeah, this does this, 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 and this. And, uh, yeah, it's it's that, oh, yeah, moment. Oh, yeah, about that. Yeah, I thought, thought about that. It's not like they're trying to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, purposefully evasive. They just forget about it. They just don't even think about it. So, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, the relationships that natural to them and they, they don't even equate. Oh no, you're focusing on the, the this production thing. And uh, um, they may, may or may not make the relationship. It's, it's why I like to, you know, and a lot of people ask me, you know, can't you do this evaluation uh, um, by just looking at our documentation, you know, our, our network configuration, you know, maybe we'll give you some PCAPs, you know, and stuff like that. I'm like, no, I need to, I need to walk through and talk to the engineers. I need to talk to the operators because it's the, those, oh yeah, moments, you know, we do this. I, I was in a, a warehouse and, and we're walking through and we're looking at stuff and I looked up and they had these big fans going. I was like, what if I turn that off? And they're like, what? What? If, yeah, what if I get on your system and and, and I turn all of those off? Well, the temperature is going to go up real quick. How does that impact everything? You know, and, uh, <laughs> you know, so it's, uh, um, you know, also going back to these systems, you know, you talked about uh, um, HAVAC systems being connected to the, uh, from the IT network. Um, uh, uh, we talked about camera servers, you know, th- those are beachheads as well, you know, for persistence. And, you know, t- you know going back to Tom's, uh, you know, uh, my understanding is you had credentials, but you also, you know, to the actual operating system, not just to the camera service. So th- th- that was right. like a beachhead into that organization, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we 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 own the the camera system itself, and it had its own operating system. Uh, it was not a Windows box, but it had its own operating. It had its own credentials, and we absolutely could have used it. it I mean, we had enough of an operating system on there that we could have used it to, uh, to as a beachhead. So, yeah, absolutely interesting. Uh, you know, and and I don't want to. So, you know, one of the things that I think is important, and I kind of want to segue us into that, is this was a third party service. This was something that um, they purchased from somebody uh, that was in the cloud. Uh, I assume that these organizations logged into their cloud portal to uh, view their camera systems, which is you know reasonable in this day and age. Uh, but at the same time, it had access to um, at least from an administrative standpoint, they could view every single uh, customer associated with that organization. So, what are y'all's concerned about how um, we uh, approach and uh, um, purchase services within the control networks that are associated with the cloud? Understanding that we're going to potentially, if we don't ask specific questions around um, uh, that uh, to understand their business models and how they're integrating or separating our, our preferences to separate their clients. So what, uh, what, what's everybody's concerned around that? Well, one thing I think is really, really important to, uh, to, to mention in this context is that uh, for Verkata, the there was a single uh, account with a single password that worked on every camera that they had out there. And I, in, in, you know, what is it? It's 2021, right? Uh, and uh, I always have to check. Uh, it's 2021. That should never happen. I, it, that, that's like 1990s, 1990s stuff that nobody ever should be doing anymore. And, um, you know, so, so that's number one uh, in all of this is that, that there was a circumstance here where, um, one single account, one single password worked on every system out there and, uh, and gave not only this hacktivist, but literally everyone in that company, I believe, either had access or knew that that account existed. And, uh, and so, so all of these cameras consistently across the board were available to anybody who worked for that organization. They could look at the cameras and do whatever they wanted with those cameras. So, so, you know, what, what, how, how do you, how do you deal with something like that? Do you go to your, uh, do your third party services and say, have we stepped out of the 1990s and are we doing, uh, you know, security for 2021 now? Uh, I, I don't know what you do with that other than, than just, you know, maybe try to work with your provider and say, what, you know, what do you, let, let's see your security posture and how you develop your code and how you develop your product. And let's see if you're using the, you know, the, the, the current 
level of security, secure code uh, development. Uh, and actually, guess. that was so the last organization I worked for, that was actually a part of one of my responsibilities uh, when I was uh, um, helping with the risk and vulnerability management is we had uh, very spe specific uh, vendor forms that they had to fill out to help us understand their security program, how they were treating uh, our data and, and whether or not it was mixed. Just because it was mixed and just because it was uh, um, uh, integrated didn't mean we were going to turn that service down or not select that service because we have a, uh, we had a business need. But uh, I needed to understand it, you know, as my responsibility as that director. Um, our legal team needed to understand it as well so that they could, because we're going to modify some of the agreements, uh, uh, service level agreements with that organization. Uh, and uh, we had a conversation, you know, they had to fill out a form and we had to have a conversation all around all that to understand the risk that we were accepting. So it's, uh, you know, it, it is possible, but you have to plan for that and be asking those questions. Well, you, you do, but you also have to recognize that, you know, a lot of times, especially today is, is it's a supply chain and you're not dealing with necessarily the root developer of each one of those components that are in that particular service, right? I mean, you take oh, AWS yes. and Microsoft out. I mean, obviously, if it's like, yeah, we're using cloud servers, they likely didn't spin up their own cloud server, right? But, but you know, but when you think of a security camera, you know, a lot of those companies, it's not like each one of them is building a camera. Somebody has packaged this together and they're using cameras or components and a protocol that, you know, is, is usually well known or, or at least common to some degree. They may be putting their own little flavor in the firmware, but ultimately, you know, they're, 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 your first tier interaction and your, in, in what you're buying from is probably not necessarily always going to be the one that actually coded that thing. And so they're going to feed back if they're filling a form, which I applaud. I think that's, you know, absolutely something you plan for. But you also, because maybe I'm a pessimist, but there's always this kind of back in the mind. It's like, are you just feeding the answer that the other guy gave you? Or did that other guy actually dig in and talk to the other person that actually coded it? Like there's, there's, there's a complexity to this that I think, um, because anybody can be a service provider today. Right. Oh, and, and so many of those services are built on other services that other people are providing. But if you're, if you're providing a service to somebody else, uh, as uh, um, in, you know, uh, with those other things, you, it's your responsibility to ensure it downstream. And so that that was our approach. And that's why we had legal involved. Legal had the verbiage to say, OK, you have you have let every everybody know that you are, um, you know, that that's downstream that you're leveraging it is doing these uh, taking on these responsibilities because these are the policies that we have and we provided them to you. And so it, it is, uh, um, you know, it, it's especially for cloud services, we know that, uh, you know, any single cloud service is built, built on top of multiple ones, but whoever's designing that one final product that's being pushed out, they have to, they have to take the responsibility for everybody else. If well, they, they haven't had those agreements, they know that then that's on them legally. They, they do. And I think the difference being is this should not be something that we have to sought out to achieve from them. This should be something that they come out of the gate knowing that they're taking right. that responsibility because and, and, a, lot of, a lot of times they're just eager to develop something to get to market. They've got probably a great idea, something new, but they need to recognize that, I, you know, you have a responsibility as you're developing this. Mm. Well, and there's the, the, and, you know, angel investors and all those need to be recognizable that you got to make sure that they're doing it right from the gate. That's, yeah. You and that's why we have the cloud organization asks you for that data. Yeah, we have the Cloud Security Consortium to help, you know, uh, with the, you know, they've thought about this uh, issue a, a lot better than we have, you know, e e you know, we, we've got a new program in SANS, you know, for, for that, and uh, it'd be interesting to see how they, uh, how they talk about that, but, you know, absolutely, all, all of these things, this makes it really complex, you know, and uh, um, associated with these things, but we would hope that they're, you know, like Tom said, we would hope that they're using uh, the considerations for 2021 around cloud security, uh, role-based access control. You know, these are things that for the last 10 years, I mean, they're a business. If, if they're not thinking about this from a business standpoint, um, then they should be up to date with role-based access control, uh, administrative support, uh, and, and so forth. So, I mean, we're not surprised to see this. It's just unfortunate. And hopefully some of that organization's making uh, better decisions. Jeff, what, how do you think this impacts 
uh, people within industrial uh, areas. Yeah, it, it's it's interesting because factories consume services. I mean, so we we've all gone through the software as a service model and say, hey, we're going to consume something simple like Microsoft Word or some product like that. Well, when you look at a factory, factories consume massive amounts of raw materials. And so everything from local distributors managing their inventory for pieces parts to a service like Air Liquide providing, you know, different services to make your product. Um, one of the things that, that in a prior life that we thought about was um, how do you bring a service provider in when you want to understand what they're consuming, what you're consuming from them and what they may be consuming from us. So you find that the network starts to leak because you might want to say, I want to know the rail car. I might want to know the nitrogen level in the tank. I might want to know things that other service providers are actually providing me, giving me. And so now you've started to network those things, not only at the top end when we yak about cloud connectivity, but at the bottom end where our plant is actually connecting to external resources that we don't know about. And so guys like us, uh, specifically, Jay, again, I've traveled with Jason a bunch or been around him a bunch. And me and my friends, we would go and look out and say like, hey, here's a service that's now connected because we because the customer accidentally connected these things in a way that it wasn't meant to be. And so uh, we need to share resources like simple things like input or data fields or databases. And so now we have connectivity in a logical manner as well. So um, it sprawls in a way that we don't even think about. It's like, it's like, you know, thinking the beachhead's coming at us from the cloud when indeed it doesn't always do that. It, it can come from the bottom, the bottom out. And, we, and there isn't a lot of things being spent, a lot of time being spent on that. And quite frankly, factories consume a bunch of products. A lot of our value that we hook to our our suppliers is that they can help us manage inventory. And immediately now we get connected to a whole bunch of supply chains we haven't even thought about. Or in the case of Air Liquide or similar, I don't want to just point on them. Yeah, yeah, no. They're, they're, they're supplying companies. like maybe oxygen to like, I don't know, a glass bottle sure. manufacturing sure. facility that maybe I've been to. Anyways, they their their job is to monitor inventory of, you know, the, the, the amount of oxygen available. And uh, so they have a real time services, internet yes. connected separately, completely separate from the plant. The only relationship to the plant is that connection. If they don't have oxygen, the plant does not run. So they have no cyber influence in it. They have no cyber influence in how that's set up. They have no, um, it's literally just a contract and um, an expectation that that supplier is doing what they need to do to be effective in their job so that the plant doesn't hurt. So yes, there is definitely supply chains where are very much are connected because they're still living raw material, but there's also these other, you know, you can look at, you know, natural gas supply, you can look at power supply, right? You look at a manufacturing when you're talking about it, it's like you have connected things, but there's also then things that are not connected, but have heavily become much more connected, um, from an internet standpoint. So, so yeah. when, uh, and you know, this just, I don't, I don't know why this didn't pop into my head earlier and, and it should have. So how much are uh, vendors, industrial control system vendors, how are they starting to integrate uh, cloud services for some of these uh, um, maintenance and uh, management features? Now, I'm talking like Alan Bradley, Rockwell, uh, Phoenix Contact, Siemens. Um, are they moving to this uh, cloud services model and, you know, can, can we have expectations that, you know, we might see something like this uh, unfortunate incident associated with them? I don't want to say specifically any vendor, whether, you know, talk specifically about any vendor solution, but the reality is it, it, everybody has gone on board with the reality that um, facilities require external support capability, support connectivity to deliver. They're, they're no longer... A plant cannot function without 
outside people helping them out in any fashion. And so cloud services definitely provides a lot of capability. When we talk about digital twin, that's the big driver that a lot of people are thinking about. Um, and, you know, I was talking to um, a mine mining company and, you know, their, their approach is we will give you the data. <laughs> you will not tap our data. You just tell us what data you need. And we have a system that we can provide you that data in a specific location that you can grab and do your analytics. When we're talking about that side, um, and there's many different avenues about cloud services, but if we're talking about, you know, maintenance or preventive maintenance or just analytic functions, you know, one thing that we, when we talk about this in class, but one of the things is, you know, the question always comes up is, what does real time mean to you? Like, how quick do you really need that data? Because a lot of times that can determine the level of connectivity you truly need. There's the ease of doing it. And, you know, it seems like the two for front runners for Industry 4.0 is OPC UA and MQTT are the primary, the primary mechanisms to move data to cloud services. So, you know, those are like heavily moving data. It doesn't mean that the MQTT has to initiate or publish from the PLC. It could publish from an edge. It could publish from somewhere in the enterprise. But, um, but I think the question really comes down to is just try and understand exactly what they need, how quickly and how much data they truly need and, and design it according to those necessities. But a lot of times what happens is people come together and they, they build a solution and then they want you to fit their solution. Mm -hmm. And so it makes this kind of, it makes it difficult. Um, Maybe the agility is better today than it was because there was a lot, and it should be theoretically because uh, the idea of MQTT is that it's an algorithm that basically decides whether something can connect or not. It's not, it's taking away, it's supposed to be easy to integrate because now you don't have to hard code things. You don't have to go on to each system and code it up the way we used to. But that level of difficulty actually gave us a little bit of a, an ability to you know, uh, scrutinize what needs to connect and why, right? But there was other complications. So the point is, is that, you know, a lot of times people are just, it's just like the camera. Mm -hmm. hey, you could run your own camera or you just pay us, you know, 10,000 a year and we'll just, we'll do it for you. And guess what? We'll monitor it for you. You know, we got a security group that'll take care of it. So, you know, that's, I, I almost feel like manufacturing is moving to a model where somebody comes up an idea to manufacture and literally they're just going to outsource every single component of it. The same we do with like, you know, I've got an idea and I can go to AWS and just spin stuff up and I can just make things. I, it's almost like manufacturing is going that same direction. Well, Where, it, it, you know, when, 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 when somebody does that and they come up with a good idea and they just spin it up, um, uh, the, uh, the challenge that they face is what if there is an explosion of people uh, of acceptance of that? And now all of a sudden they just did this as a proof of concept. They get a lot of people asking and they've got to figure out that way to get the services out there so that they're successful. Um, and the security issues get, I mean, they're, they're dealing with production issues. They're dealing with uh, ensuring that they've, they can get product and services to their people. Um, and uh, in, uh, in a way that um, they weren't uh, considering before, uh, because they were just developing that product and services. And now all of a sudden they've got these uh, people asking them to do it securely um, or, or not asking them to do it securely. And so they don't focus on those requirements. And usually that's what it is. They didn't have, and, and this drives everything industrial control systems. If you don't have the requirements up front, you don't build to those requirements. So, um, you know, they, these services are, are like that as well. And verify. I think that's the thing is we're, we're like, so caught up on, on you know, we, 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 we need a solution that's going to give us X, Y, Z to make our business better. Right. And this has stemmed for the last, well, as long as I've been in the industry, looking at from a security standpoint, security is not in that list. Oh, and if it is, it's like, well, and then the vendor will turn around like, yeah, yeah, we use encryption. Okay. But <laughs> that doesn't really mean anything. But to the, you know, the, um, to, to particular buyers that that might sound good because they're not informed. And so it's like, how do we get more of that influence in not to discredit the solution, 
And I think this is where the confusion happens. They feel that we're coming in, we're just trying to be the hard nose and we want to do it the difficult, more expensive way. No, we just want to make sure we understand what risks we are going to consume as a result so that we can appropriately plan for how to mitigate that risk. But that's... Tom, yeah, Tom, you had something? I was just going to say, I really like this, the idea that you put forward just a little bit ago that once you've got some kind of protocol that allows you to get data in real time, suddenly every, everybody needs data in real time, whereas before they didn't. And, and uh, I, I just, I think that sometimes when we make things so much easier, suddenly everybody goes, oh, well, now it'd be great to have that data in real time, but you didn't have it in real time before. You don't need it in real time. Why suddenly now do you just because it's available? And so I, I really think that's a good idea and a good kind of back when, back when it was harder, people had to think about it. And, and when, when now when you make it really, really easy, they don't have to think about it. They just kind of demand everything because it's easy even though it takes three days for them to actually change the oil pressure that they were told to do three days ago. Yeah, I actually, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm still, I'm still wondering why people need me to answer their texts in three minutes. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> you don't, you don't need real time text message or conversations so you can wait. Uh, we, we should probably, we should probably kind of uh, um, bring this to a close and, you know, ar around our thoughts and so forth. Uh, Jeff, uh, you, uh, um, do you have anything, you know, considering Coors, considering uh, um, the Verkata, uh, you know, what, what do you think uh, is important that people take away? Yeah, so architecture matters. Um, when we look at connectivity and the explosion of connectivity, we have to think about what systems actually affect our production. What things do we need? Uh, Jason mentioned a lot about labels and uh, you know, what do we need to actually make the product, track the product and, you know, get it to get it to our customers. Um, we we're finding, like Tom Liston said, is there's a want and a need for data to be, you know, more real time so we can make real time decisions on what it is we're going to make, because many factories can make different things depending on the product that's uh, or the the raw ingredients that's available to them. So anyway, the architecture of systems really matter. Um, remote connectivity is very important these days. I mean, they don't drop factories on a golf course. They put them out in the middle of nowhere and, you know, guys who want to, guys and gals who want to do this for a living need remote access so that they can help the, the people actually making product in remote things. So it's, it's a challenge that we actually have to solve it will cause our customers to have to re-architect kind of the way the systems are thought about right now. So that's kind of my closing thoughts. Thank you. Uh, Tom, you know, uh, uh, what, what are you uh, about Coors and the, um, and the camera stuff? I think the Coors thing just kind of brings to light that idea about unknown unknowns. Um, what we don't know that we don't know about our uh, business integrations, uh, are, are going to be the things that are going to just tear our organizations apart. And so I think, it, I think it just highlights the need to really sit down, think about these things, tabletop them as best you can, and kind of try to narrow the scope of those unknown unknowns out there for us. Uh, it, it, you know, obviously we can't get rid of them all, but maybe we can narrow them down as best we can and, and start to get a handle on how we're going to deal with situations where we uh, uh, where the unexpected truly happens. So that's that's my takeaway from it. Thanks, sir. Uh, Jason, I just leverage off the of both of their points. Um, but when we take when we talk about architect, we're not just talking about a fancy little line with a few switches, and and that's our architecture. We're talking about the nitty gritty of how the application actually works. What is the relationship with the applications? What's the communications? How are the servers? Are they installed on the same box? Are they separate? Can they be separate? There's a lot of things that go into play before we even get to really the network side of the architecture. Um, and I think that's heavily overlooked. A lot of times we're, you know, best example, Oh, I'm going to have a Citrix system. So they put one little box and one line and say, that's the Citrix. Guess what? It's way more complex than that. So when you architect, you got to 
stringing it all out so that you can clear, have a clear visual so that you can decide on what side of the fence things can be on and should be on, or should they just be arc, arc, um, enclaved out into their own little network, right? You can't make those decisions unless you actually unwind everything and make sure you truly understand what the, what is actually happening inside the environment. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Uh, and, you know, my thoughts, uh, you know, on, uh, on these things, you know, uh, uh, from the uh, uh, Vercada, I'll start with Vercada, uh, is uh, just that, you know, we're going to need, uh, we're going to need secure, uh, uh, excuse me, cloud services. And, uh, but we need to understand uh, within the control networks, how that's going to impact whether we need it or not, uh, how it's being integrated, asking the questions, especially as our vendors come in to us and start saying that, hey, we'd like to move some of this to the cloud services, whether it's for maintenance or whatever, um, coming up with some clear questions to get an understanding of what that actually means, uh, like y'all were saying, I, I think that's important. From the core standpoint, I really hope that we see a good detailed report about what's going on. Hopefully they get with their legal team and identify a way to put out the information to the industry. This is what happened to us because if it stays quiet, if it's not put out there, then the attackers are winning. They can't, uh, the, you know, everybody's blind to this and we can't learn from this. So I, I encourage them uh, to put the information out so that it's uh, um, publicly accessible, uh, that, they, that you know, they go to something like RSA or, or one of the other larger uh, uh, security conferences and talk about the challenges, what worked, what didn't work. And I mean, you don't have to talk about where you went uh, and you don't have to necessarily give uh, um, a, a media presence to the actual uh, criminals and the attackers, uh, but you can at least uh, let people, keep people informed uh, about what happened so that they can start table topping, you know, like we've talked about so that they can start planning for these events as well. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining me. And thank you for everybody that uh, stopped by to listen. Uh, you know, uh, Sansa. We hope they get the beer working again, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Get the beer flowing. And, uh, um, and uh, you know, and we need to get the cameras up and running, too, so we can watch everybody, you know, drinking their Coors beer. So <laughs> it's the beer. not as important as the beer. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody, and uh, have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to this ICS Hot Take with the SANS ICS team. If you would like to join the SANS ICS community, please check the show notes for links to the community and other resources provided by the SANS ICS team. If you have comments about this topic, please add them to the comments below or reach out to the SANS ICS community. If you would like to see more content like this, please like and subscribe to the SANS ICS channel. Thank you and have a great day.